Welcome to the next installment of the Miami Group Sierra Club Virtual Backpack Series. Tonight's topic is water, where to find it, how to treat it, and how to carry it. Denise, would you like to start us off by introducing yourself? Now I'd like to tell you, my name is Denise Tingle, and I've been camping, hiking, backpacking for 45 plus years. I am the hiking committee chair for the Miami Group Sierra Club, along with an instructor for the backpacking school. I lead cycling rides and backpacking, just backpacking and cycling, and I love just being in the outdoors. Nancy? Hi, my name is Nancy Ball, and I've been uh, backpacking and leading trips um, since 2005, really to places all over the world. Um, I started camping and hiking back when I was a child. I've been doing it my entire life. This past year, I launched, uh, launched a new business, planning and leading adventure trips. And my company name is Summit Trek and Travel. And uh, Barry? Welcome, everyone. My name is Barry Randall, otherwise known as Aardvark. And uh, I've been backpacking, camping, hiking for... Uh, God awful long time. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, Miami Group Sierra Club uh, outings chair, and that just means I lead a committee that organizes a lot of uh, outdoor activities, including backpacking for all different levels. And Brian. Yeah, thanks for joining everybody. My name is Brian Wolf, uh, trail name Iceman. I got that uh, along the Appalachian Trail now about 13 years ago. It was my first backpacking trip. Um, and since then, it's led me to all kinds of uh, other adventures, including uh, where I am now uh, as co-owner of Roads, Rivers, and Trails. So we're an uh, outdoor store in Milford, Ohio. And so I have the pleasure of uh, being surrounded by people's adventures every day. Denise, we'll uh, hand it back to you. Okay. So let's start with uh, don't skip on water. I'd like to start with feedback. So let's do a poll. Nancy, could you launch the first poll, please? How much water should you drink on a moderate day of hiking or backpacking to stay hydrated? One liter, two liters, three. How about a 12 pack? Of water, right? Water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we've seen people take 12 pack of beer before. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about 88% um, of those out there have made their selections. We'll, we'll give it another second or two. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and we will share the results. So Denise, looks like 60% of those who responded said two liters and 40% said three liters. And no one said one liter and nobody said a 12 pack. Awesome. Well, let's start by reviewing what is necessary and how much water we really need. Your body can use up to eight ounces of water every 15 minutes. It means that a chug session won't hydrate you quite as well as consistently hydrating. Your body will lose about a half liter just overnight through your breath and perspiration. Overall drinking a minimum of two liters or preferably closer to three liters a day is highly recommended. But this, is, but this does not account for all the water you'll need per day. You also for cooking, cleaning, and any hot drinks you may desire. So how much how much also varies by person, the heat, the effort. Rule of thumb for me is about two liters per 10 miles. More temperature is over 80 degrees uphill or I'm carrying more weight. Again hey, it's it, Hey, Denise, yeah. would, would you repeat the part about what the, uh, the average is for you? Because the, the sound quality kind of garbled there a little bit. Okay. And do you want me to stop sharing the results? Close that, I guess. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Which one should I start over? This, where you said the rule of thumb for you. Okay. The rule of thumb for me is two liters or, say, per 10 miles doing an average hike. So more if temperature is over 80 degrees uphill or I'm carrying more weight. And again, keep in mind, it depends on what people, how much water each person drinks normally. So through this talk, now to talk about water, so through this talk, we will 
dive more into how much water to carry, how to carry it and where to find it, and how to assure you are drinking clean and safe water. It is very common for people to carry a trip's worth of water their first time out. Trekking up a mountain with a few gallon jugs will ruin your experience. We'll get more about that, but let this sink in. Each liter of water weighs about two pounds. So to even carry a single day's worth of water based off our previous slide will be eight pounds. So we'll start at the top here with where to find it. Finding natural water resources. We'll get more in, into this in trip planning presentation, but here are some basics. Your trip success always starts with good research and planning. Having area maps give you a head start at understanding where and how to pass a natural water source. But don't stop there. Blogs, guidebooks, and local beta all give you the most up-to-date information needed. Some water is seasonally, seasonally reliable and water patterns can change. My go-to is always a local park rangers. They are, they are boots around every day. Notice the graph above that notes less than reliable sources. Some may also note polluted sources, but we'll get more to that. Water containers. So we know how much and where, but how do we best carry it all? Everyone has their own preference here, so here are the pros and cons. A durable water bottle, most often an algae, will last as long as you cannot lose it. It is leak proof, connects to many filters, extremely durable, handles hot liquids, and does not leach toxins into your water with extended use. A bottle will provide an easy carry around campfire and picnic bench solution. A water bladder, pictured here, is the most accessible option that is stored inside the pack and sends a drink hose over your shoulder. This allows you to drink more often and stay more hydrated. It also is also and compact when empty. Use caution for frozen drink tubes in winter and losing track of how much water you have left as it's monitored. My go-to, I often use one of each. Depending on the frequency of water, I like to be able to carry up to three liters of water. Remember, I may never actually fill up to that level and I won't be at that level all day every day. The benefit is that I can. With a two liter batter, bladder in single bottle, I have storage, accessibility, and I use my filter. Do the moderators have any other suggestions here? Barry or uh, Brian, Nancy? Um, so I'll say, uh, yeah, just, Sometimes I carry, I have, a, I have a bag that I'll carry dirty water in to be filtered later, um, which gives me some additional flexibility. Uh, so it doesn't look like either one of these and it's not intended, I don't intend to drink directly out of it. And then my next go-to actually is gonna be on the next slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll save that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would add, this, add the same thing, that um, my go-to is actually uh, the cheap solution that we're gonna see in a second here, but, uh, uh, Personally, I prefer water bottles to the hydration bladder, but it really is a very, very just personal decision. There are absolute advantages to either one. And I know people who just love the bladders and it does, you do drink a lot more when you, when you have a hydration bladder, um, but it's really just what, what you're used to and what really fits your hiking style. I agree with you, Barry. And you might start out with one system and maybe a couple trips down the road, you end up changing your system because you see other people, what they do, and you try it and go, oh, this is a lot better than what I did before. I think all of us have experienced that. So let's move on. Um, so inexpensive DIY. Want to go lighter? A plastic water bottle, like you see this smart water, will be much lighter than an algae, just without some of the benefits. If you use a squeeze filter, this will come especially in handy. Will come especially handy, but we'll get to that later. Does anyone have any questions? Before we move on? Um, <clears throat> nothing in the chat box so far, but if anybody wants to throw one up there, um, uh -huh. we'll have another question break, but yeah, we kind of threw a, a lot of stuff about water onto you there. 
<laughs> but please feel free to put your uh, questions on the chat box uh, and uh, as you think of them as we go through the presentation. Okay, are we ready to go on, Brian? All right, let's do it. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate that. Um, all right, so we're going to do it again. We're going to start with another poll. Uh, if you could please launch poll number two. Um, poll number two is what do you want protection from when drinking from natural water sources? Pick everything that applies, anything that you'd want protection from. This one takes a little longer because there are a lot of answers to read. Yeah. <laughs> this is the most options I think we've had so far. Yeah. So, so far we have at least uh, some people who have selected everything on the list. And uh, we have one that everyone has selected so far. Oh, I'm right. curious. Just can't see there. it. You can't see it? Ah, well, another okay. results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it out because it looks like just about everybody has responded. And here we go. So can you see that, Brian? Yes. Good answer. Right. Bacteria um, being the, uh, the unanimous one there, but lots of concern over the protozoa, hard metals, chemicals, and uh, a lot on viruses there, too. Um, okay, awesome. So now we're going to get into uh, how to protect from each one of those things. So that's important to kind of think about um, as we get into our treatment options. So we're going to jump right into treatment uh, and why is it so important. So uh, we've seen celebrities like Bear Grylls, contestants on Survivor shows, and YouTube sensations show us how we can drink straight from the source. Well, these cute little guys in the picture here may convince you otherwise. These are our plush friends, Gerardia, E. coli, and Salmonella. Uh, yes, they make stuffed animals for everything uh, nowadays, including uh, you could buy a COVID stuffed animal. Uh, <laughs> these plush toys will wreak havoc on your body and stomach, and when not treated, can even be fatal depending on um, uh, what you consume. So these pictures are actually from uh, a factory tour I took. Uh, factory and laboratory tour uh, in Seattle at Cascade Designs. Cascade is the maker of MSR, a uh, popular water filter uh, solution. Uh, it's the only filter manufacturer in the U.S. Uh, with their own high-level microbiology uh, lab. Uh, and what that means is they both build and test the filters on site uh, using uh, real live bacteria and viruses um, that would otherwise get through and attack your system. So MSR uses the highest level of tests, uh, both like civilian level and uh, also like strict, more stringent, like military level tests on all of their products. Uh, so we're a big fan and they do that from beginning to end of the product life cycle. Uh, that's a big MSR push, but it's just really cool going to um, a factory and seeing this happen and understanding kind of what they put into it. Um, so my point overall is that you wanna treat your water. Um, a treatment can uh, protect against bacteria, protozoa, chemicals, taste odor, particulate viruses, everything that we had listed above. Um, but this is dependent on your treatment choice. Um, even a clear water spring uh, that seems safe may have additional runoff from animal or human waste, decaying animals, heavy metals, or farm runoff is uh, quite common, especially uh, in the Midwest. Um, so always want to treat somehow. So uh, what is right for you? Uh, first, a clarification on a purifier versus a filter. A purifier makes it drinkable by killing or destroying the reproductive capabilities of harm harmful substances. Um, so if something is purified, it's just not going to replicate in your body once consumed. A filter will totally remove harmful sub substances. Um, all of these options are going to treat um, against bacteria and protozoa. Um, so there's, there's some pretty common factors with any of these solutions that we're gonna go through. Uh, filter options can include pumps, gravity systems, straws, squeeze bags, and presses. So there's lots of mechanics that you could choose uh, in finding one that is right. Um, uh, so with filters, in addition to those things, they're also going to um, uh, 
uh, take out particulate, so the dirt, um, and often could do taste or odors, heavy metals or chemicals. Uh, so some things that you can't find uh, with a purifier. Um, purifier options include UV pens, tablets and drops, uh, or boiling, really. Uh, this will treat, uh, in addition to bacteria or protozoa, the, the UV light or tablets and drops will uh, also protect against viruses. Uh, so uh, they both have some pros and cons there. Um, so um, picking what's right for you, uh, a few other things to consider. Um, I've used many filters uh, from MSR, the Mini Works and the Guardian, uh, from Katadin is a great brand. I've used the Hiker Pro, uh, the Grail, uh, which you see on the list, the Sawyer Squeeze. Um, and like everything else, you'll have to prioritize. Um, I picked a few filters here to really kind of illustrate, um, illustrate the point, but we'll go through weight, speed, longevity of the filter, ease of use, protection, and cost. So with the uh, first slide here, uh, you can see weight. Um, tablets being uh, extremely light. Um, you could range anywhere from less than an ounce to 17 ounces. Um, one thing to note here is with the Grail is that it's also a bottle, so you have to carry one less bottle and it offsets some of the weight of the filter itself. Um, if you're an ultralight backpacker though, the Sawyer systems um, are, are pretty much the, the way to go. Um, other ones not on this list that are going to be lighter weight it would be like the MSR Hyperflow or the Trail Shot, and they'll all do great. If your priority is speed and ease of use, uh, so we have the same things uh, up here, um, same filters uh, or treatments. Uh, so if you want to get water and stay on the move, um, which is a lot of people's main concern, um, you, you're going to look at the liters per minute or um, in some cases with tablets, uh, it's a really quick action. So you can stay on the move, but it takes 30 minutes at least, depending on what you're using uh, for those tablets to actually take effect and um, uh, treat your water. Um, so in this case, the Grail is five liters per minute. Um, uh, the Guardian's 2.5 liters per minute. These are really quick if you're actually stopping um, and um, doing a lot of water, maybe uh, for a group or anything like that. Um, so personally, I like to sit for a little bit, uh, so I don't mind it taking a little bit longer. Um, find a, you know, sit by a stream, relax, change layers, dry my feet, have a snack. Um, the speed isn't, it isn't my number one, but everyone has to prioritize these. Um, next up is the, uh, longevity. Um, so how long does the unit, um, uh, each, each unit last. Um, so all filters will have this labeled. Uh, please note, um, we will openly admit that you will throw away your Sawyer um, closer to 1,000 liters than 350,000 liters. So not quite uh, advertised correctly on that one, uh, but it will still last for a long time. Uh, most filters that use a hollow fiber technology uh, have a gradual decreasing speed with every use. Um, so that would be, in this case, the Sawyer and the Guardian, both have uh, hollow fiber, and that's a number of, of filters. Also very important to note in relation to longevity, uh, price um, and, and cleaning, um, which, which we'll get to some of that. Uh, some filters have replaceable elements though. Um, so from this list, uh, all of the bottom three, can, you can replace just the element uh, when it's reached its lifespan. So you don't have to buy a whole new filter. You could just buy a new uh, filter element. Um, next is just ease of use or regularity of cleaning. Um, <coughs> most hollow fiber units require a back flush. Uh, this means taking clean water and forcing it backward through the unit to wash out any clogs. While most ceramic elements, so from list list would be the MSR Mini Works, uh, for example, the catered in would be another one. Use a brush or a pad to scrub away uh, any collected grime from that ceramic element. Uh, the ease and practicality of this would depend on the filter. Uh, so you have to dig a little deeper for uh, how that process goes sometimes. Uh, notice that the Guardian is self-cleaning. Uh, this is super unique. Um, uh, just like your children assume the house does when they run out the door. Self-cleaning. It's all going to be clean when you come back. So it actually reserves a little bit of water 
uh, from your each pump that you do to back flush itself. So it's a pretty cool novel thing. Uh, what does it protect against? Uh, so what level of protection do you want? So we started with that question, right? Uh, we already mentioned that waterborne viruses are less common in the States, um, and this is often an overseas add-on, uh, but a lot of you do want protection from, from the viruses, and so it's something to consider there. Uh, do you mind taste or odor? That was one of the things that was answered uh, a little bit less, but still a lot of you. Um, also note chemicals and metals, while they don't have immediate impacts, we all know they can have cumulative negative results. Uh, lastly, not shown here is that solutions like tablets or UV light boiling do not remove particulate either. Um, so a few of the methods that uh, we picked uh, wouldn't remove the dirt that was uh, previously mentioned. Uh, no big deal, you just have to have a friend check your teeth after every drink. Uh, but do know that all of the above are going to treat against bacteria and protozoa, like we said. Um, but how, how much protection do you, do you want? Um, and you want those other elements of protection. Um, and lastly, we get to cost. Um, first off, we do uh, trust all of these brands and have used them. You can range from $25 to $350, as you see here, for a long-term solution. So um, if you were with us for footwear, just like boots, I like to look at the long-term cost as well. Uh, so the right column shows cost per liter treated. Um, for this example, we put the Sawyer at 1,000 liters used, just like we discussed. Um, this is, you know, could be pretty important. So this, um, the Grail and the tablets, the tablets being only $10, if you go hiking more often, will be the most expensive, um, almost by far, the Grail and the tablets, um, quite more expensive than the other options there. Um, so uh, this is important, especially if you're going with bigger groups. Um, while the grail was really fast, it would be a terrible investment for a scout troop. You'd be replacing the filter so often and it'd get fairly uh, expensive. I remember that one only lasted 250 liters. Uh, also notice that those light and fast tablets will be the most expensive over time. So those are all going to be factors that you're going to consider uh, throughout. Um, some other tips. Uh, never let your filter freeze uh, as it can crack and no longer protect you. Um, the, now again, this, this could be where having a filter um, that has a replaceable element uh, could be good. So if you're uncertain, you don't have to buy a whole new system, just replace the filter. Uh, test your filter before every trip to make sure it works properly and no seals need replaced. Uh, so especially if you are using a pump of some sort uh, if a gasket is, is gone, you're not going to get the right flow out of it. Um, if you have a ceramic filter, uh, you want to gauge the lifespan of the filter before your trip. Um, so there's a way to, uh, to measure the, um, the use of that filter. Um, with any of these options, whether it's a squeeze, a press, a, a pump, uh, you want to be gentle. Um, impatience uh, won't be your friend and, and really you could just kind of put too much force into it and, and break the mechanism there. So just be patient with the flow. Uh, and of course, if it slows too much, it's just a sign that it probably needs cleaning. Uh, when using a filter, try to find a spot uh, when you're next to the water, say you're, you're moving water, find a spot with moderate flow. Fast flow is gonna carry heavier particulate uh, and will slow your filter faster. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, if there's no flow, you'll find stagnant growth, uh, and typically that affects taste and odor more so. Um, so I like a place that just has a moderate flow or, or pretty good flow, and I just kind of come to the slow end of it. Um, and lastly, watch for cross-contamination. Um, and this is going to be true with any of the uh, uh, options that we discussed. Um, uh, you could treat your water, but if you don't uh, store your filter correctly or um, reuse the same bag or maybe you're using a, a dirty bag for the squeeze option um, and things get mixed up uh, then you won't be doing yourself any favors of course uh, I hey, can, yeah I'm sorry before you go on I was just going to say um, correct me if I'm wrong but one of the big concerns one of the things that I worry about is uh, with my water filter is that if it were to accidentally get frozen, 
I can't necessarily tell that just by looking at it. So I've got to be really sure when I'm winter camping that I don't mm -hmm. let it freeze, <laughs> that I just don't let it get in um, uh, it, where it's possible for it to be frozen. Um, do some of these have a way that you can tell just by looking at them? Um, if it had a, uh, that's a good point, Nancy, and yet I, I, for a lot of winter trips, if it's going to be cold enough, sometimes I'll sleep with the, the filter. You put it in a Ziploc or a dry bag and you need to carry it around with you a little bit more closely or insulate it. Um, but the only ones that you'd really be able to tell is maybe like the ceramic ones. Uh, it'd be more obvious if there were um, a crack there, uh, potentially. Um, but that's, that's about it. The other ones are going to be pretty tough. And all it takes is that water to expand. Um, and all of these are relying on really small pores to uh, filter out or trap, um, you know, uh, everything it's protecting you against. And so one freeze and that widens up and it's all just a gateway for it to come through. So. Thanks. Um, and I can see that there's a lot of red bubbles for comments, yeah. which is good, because uh, that was, that's kind of a lot of information, but that's, that's good. So now we can kind of dig into, um, we can dig into some questions. So Brian, I'll, I'll, mine was the first one up there. I have the be free and I, mm -hmm. I didn't notice that uh, on your slide, but no. I usually bring the soy or the be free. Mm -hmm. The um, it's the catadin uh, freebie. Yeah. Free. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, I at first I didn't like it, but I like it a lot now because it's a lot quicker than the Sawyer. But I also bring the Sawyer as my backup. Actually, I bring three half the time. Is the Sawyer, the Be Free, and <laughs> the tablets just in case because there have been people that have only brought in one on our trips before, and they needed you know they didn't have another source. Yeah. So and I know, think the, the B3 is, uh, is light, so. Yep. Yeah, I've heard good things about that one as well. Um, and I, I recommend tablets and like in your first aid kit or whatever, because yeah. that can be another emergency source. Um, uh, if I always it, take tablets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So another question uh, from Quinn is, do you back flush every time after filtering? So um, I'll, I'll clean my filter just based off of the flow. Uh, I've, I've, you know, been um, filtered from water that I can get 10 plus liters from, and it just seems like I could just keep going. And then I've had water uh, that I've had to clean after every liter just because it is just slowing down. So I, I just, I, I would just say as needed, You'll, as you notice that it slows down, um, I mean, definitely clean it at the end of the trip. Uh, but as far as during the trip, uh, just as on an as needed basis. Cool. There's a yeah, I do. Uh, I, I think it's worth repeating though that you know at the end of the trip, I, I don't know how much difference it makes, Brian. But I always feel like you should store it clean, you know, mm -hmm. clean and dry. So I always try and and flush it out and then actually put some air through it too, so it's uh, yep. relatively dry just until the next trip. Yep, absolutely, and that's also. I, and that Barry, you bring up another good point as far as just uh, flushing all the water out. If uh, if you are in colder environments, um, just stopping and getting all the water out of the element. So maybe unscrewing the top and dumping excess water out, or pumping it all of it all of it through, so that you you're less likely to have a lot of water build up or freeze there. Um, yeah. yeah, totally. And I do follow Brian. Uh, I think everyone should look at the manufacturer uh, papers with it when it when you get one, because it will tell you how to clean it after your trip. Some of mm -hmm. them even say, you know, flush them with Clorox. Uh, I think the Sawyer does after so many uses, um, or if you've been on a long trip. Mm -hmm. so always make sure you follow the directions when it comes to your particular uh, filter. Absolutely. There's a comment from Jay saying that he prefers to use a filter system and have a tablet backup. Um, so I'm not sure if he means, that would be one way of, like if you were to, traveling out of the country, for instance, um, of making sure that you're preventing um, viruses, that you could, you could use your filter to, to filter out all the particulates and all the, um, the bacteria and everything else, but everything but the viruses, and then treat it with uh, tablets 
in addition to that for, uh, for the viruses, depending on what kind of place you're. Well, and I, I think what Brian mentioned earlier too, is, you know, the tablets are so light, just having a few of those in your first aid kit, just in case, you know, you're not sure, maybe you forgot and left your filter out and maybe it froze last night or, you know, God forbid you lose it in the stream or something, you know, just having a few tablets as a backup. It's just, they're so lightweight. It's just yeah. worth right. having a couple. And sometimes you just get lazy. <laughs> yeah, or you're lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I see that uh, Quinn asked, is the MSR hand pump in your picture the MSR work? Um, let's see. So in the, um, I think it, they look very similar. I believe the ones pictured are the, um, in the picture, uh, uh, let's see, Nancy, Nancy. Slide 15, I think, Nancy. That's the, um, I believe yeah. that's. Mini works. The mini works and guardian look very similar. That's actually the guardian. Uh, the mini works does not look much different, though. Okay. Yep, pretty similar. Okay. Yeah, if you trust your, I mean, as far as the tablets, in addition to, um, you know, if like everyone said, um, you know, having them is, is going to be a good thing. They will do the addition of viruses if if whatever system you're using does not eat do that. Um, but again, you know, the depends on the filter you have too and how much uh, trust you have in it. Like I said, that's one reason why I really like MSR um, is, is um, you know, they, they, they put it through the test and that if I'm not concerned with viruses, I'm very confident in just those units uh, doing uh, what they, what they advertise. Yeah. Quinn had a question or a question out here saying that uh, another outfitter had recommended both filtering and a tablet. And I assume that's right. both at once, um, which, you know, my understanding is that pretty much in the United States, uh, virus is not a problem, as we've said a couple of times. So, you know, I, I to me, putting a tablet and filtering, uh, I, I don't quite get that unless you're just normally using tablets and you have like real muddy water or something. I, so um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't use both. Right. The one time when we used both was actually in Africa and it right. was because the water needed sure. filtered, but that, that there, there was still a need to uh, purify right. it in, in addition. Right. But in, in the U S um, I, I don't remember ever being in a situation where we felt it was necessary to use both. Yeah. And uh, Bob says, I have used a coffee filter on the intake to filter out large debris. That's mm -hmm. a good practice, too, a good way to do that. Yeah, if a coffee filter or a bandana, if you wanted to use tablets or a SteriPen, uh, you could just grab one of those guys to, to get the big stuff okay. out. Some multi-use items there, some thinking. Right. There you and, go. And Carolina, has anybody used the Life Straw personal filter? I, I haven't. How about you, Brian? The life straw, Brian? No, uh, you can use Sawyer uh, in a lot of the same ways. Um, you know, a lot of it, um, and, the, and life straw actually has several products now, but when they started, it right. was literally just the straw. Now they have products more similar to the Sawyer. Um, but as far as just the straw element, it just kind of, it, you could you could have it in a, maybe a day pack for emergencies, uh, but it's, you know, overall won't be a great long-term or backpacking solution um, as far as the straw element goes. Um, it requires you to stay with the water or to carry dirty water. And it also requires you to be the um, mechanic. So we went over all these mechanics that make things really easy, uh, pumping or pressing gravity. Um, and this, it would be your um, suction, <laughs> I guess. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree. As, as far as their straw product, I, I just never quite got it. I mean, a Sawyer is pretty much as lightweight as a straw and is just so much more versatile or anything like the Sawyer. There's several other products like it, but just the straw itself, I, I just never, just seemed too awkward. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions we have. We can go on. Okay. So we're about to finish up here before, um, before we conclude things. So we do have one more poll for you. And this is just to help kind of give us an idea 
of um, whether we're giving you good information that's useful or not. So if you would just give us an idea uh, how many new ideas you got from this, uh, things that hopefully will help you understand and deal with your water needs while you're on the trail. And if you had any especially good ideas, if you would just tap that out in the chat box for us, uh, we'd appreciate knowing all that. And uh, in just a minute, we're going to switch over for anyone who's got time and wants to hang around. We're actually ahead of schedule. Ooh, we're quite a bit ahead of schedule, so we've got lots of time for questions. Um, we're going to have a live Q and A in just in just a few minutes. I've got just a few more little notes for you while people finish up this poll, and then I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen <laughs> um, so that I can share some information with you. Um, let's see, about ten. 11, 11 of 17, 64%. So I'll give you all just a couple more minutes and try to capture as much as we can. Uh, we really do appreciate your feedback. It's, it's helpful to us to know if uh, what, what we're providing is useful information or if we need to take a different tack on things. So uh, hearing from you is very good for us. So uh, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and stop that now. Um, we have, a, like I said, a couple of finishing thoughts to share with you, but I need to stop sharing my screen for just a minute so that I can put some information in the chat box for you. So bear with me, if you would, please. I can't have my screen open and put these things in the chat box, or at least if I can, I don't know how to Is do it. Is there something I can uh, pop yeah. in there for you? Oh, actually, Barry, yeah. So um, there are several links on the Sierra Club site that I wanted to put in there. Um, if you have a copy of the PowerPoint with you, you'll be able to see what they are on the next slide. I don't know. Are you, do you have access to that where you are? Uh, I don't have the PowerPoint up, but you're talking about just the uh, outdoor calendar, uh, the upcoming I webinars? think a couple of things. I think okay. I can just go ahead and go do ahead. it real quick. Here. All right, go so, for it. Yeah, so I'm putting in, um, one thing is that if you are liking what you see here, um, and interest, uh, interested in supporting the work that we're doing for the Sierra Club so we can do more of this sort of thing um, and um, are in a position to do so. A small donation to the Sierra Club Miami group would be very welcome. And I'm not multitasking very well. I can't talk and type at the same time. So I'm gonna stop talking <laughs> to make sure I don't type something that just doesn't work right now. And then I'm gonna go back and tell you what all these things are. So bear with me, please. I would like to say I saw a lot of new people that joined us this evening, quite a few new people that haven't been on our webinars before. So welcome. Nice. Uh, and nice. we, we have them scheduled every Thursday through the, uh, will be through the end of uh, mid-October. So welcome and hopefully you'll be able to join some other ones down the road. Yeah. And I, nice. I think Nancy mentioned this previously, but if, uh, if there's a topic that you would like to see, just uh, throw it out there because uh, we're pretty flexible. Absolutely. So the last couple of things that I wanted to share with you are this slide here. Again, if you love the outdoors as much as we do, we'd love to have you come and play with us. <laughs> come join us to explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. And there's some easy ways to do that. One is that you can become a Sierra Club member. Um, you can make a donation, as I just mentioned. You can also join us on our meetup, and uh, our meetup is actually open to anyone. You don't have to be a, a Sierra Club member in order to participate in our meetup activities. Right now, those are all um, virtual activities, which means things like this, this webinar. But sooner or later, we'll get past this pandemic and we'll be able to meet again in person. And then the last thing on there is that you can become a volunteer with the Sierra Club. Um, I put links on the PowerPoint, which there's a link in the chat box now that'll take you to the page that has a copy of the PowerPoint. It's a PDF version of it. So you'll be able to download that for yourself if you'd like. And then lastly, if you are an experienced outdoors person and you have skills that you'd like to share, um, we'd love to have you join us on the outings committee. Uh, we're looking for outings leaders who have a passion for sharing their experiences with others. And even though, like I said, right now, we're only able to do that virtually through our webinar series, someday we will be back out on the trails and the waterways again in person. And um, I have to tell you that we've had, we have so much fun in this committee and this, the things that we do together as a group and 
and uh, with the many, many people who join us on these, out, um, on these outings, uh, we've made a lot of lifelong friends from doing this. So we'd love to have you join us. If you're interested in that, uh, the best way would be just to send me an email. Um, it's summittrektravel at yahoo.com. This is Nancy. And um, one of my responsibilities is to help get volunteers connected uh, with the Outings Committee for, um, for outing, Sierra Club Outings Committee work. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, this presentation has been brought to you by Roads, Rivers, and Trails, um, our independently owned local outdoor outfitter in Milford, Ohio, and by Summit Trek and Travel, your adventure travel connection, and by the Miami Group Sierra Club, um, which is part of the largest grassroots environmental um, work, environmental movement in the whole country. Um, I think... At this point, we're going to open this up for anybody who can stick around. If, you, if you're interested in having continued the, the discussion or you have some other questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen again so that we can all see each other better. And we will unmute you so that, if I can find the right button to unmute everyone. So you, I you just have, did it. Yeah, you now have control over um, your own mute button. So if anybody has a question they'd like to ask, you can you can still type it in the chat box if you'd like to, or you can just shout it out and we'll, we're ready to take your questions. I, I did forget to mention one thing. One of the links that I put in the chat box is to next week's webinar topic, which is gonna be presented by Barry. And it is all about knots. And I don't remember the exact title, but it's something about there's a knot for that. So listen. Oh, I know what it was. Are you at the end of your rope? There's a knot for that. You're anyway. the one that came up with all these clever titles. I, I know, and then I, I forgot <laughs> them. I have to reinvent them in my head every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, ready for your questions. Uh, Nancy, it looks like everybody is not unmuted. Um, everyone has the power to unmute themselves now, so if you have a question, you should be able to just hover over oh, your your box and unmute yourself. We would ask you like that, that when you're not kick, speaking, man. if you would if you would mute yourself when you're not speaking, then it um, makes it easier for everybody to hear. Yeah, maybe no one has any questions. We did so well, we answered all their questions. Maybe I can see that people are still awake; they're moving around. So it says host <laughs> not allowing unmute is what Jay uh -oh. is saying. Can okay. you put boiling water into the bottle, Brian? Uh, now, Gene, yes. Um, <clears throat> it actually works as a great hot bottle if you're a little cold at night to put, the, put your sleeping bag. Um, but I would not uh, trust the seal or the uh, plastic of any of these like smart water bottles or other. Yeah, I've actually tried that as part of a wilderness first aid, uh, putting boiling water into a smart water bottle as a uh, basically <laughs> a, a warm warmer for, you know, we were practicing hypothermia and it, it definitely melted the bottle. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I would definitely stick with Nalgene if you're going to do that trick, which is a great trick, by the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, Barry, I have to say, I really appreciate you taking one for the team on that and doing the research for all of it. That's good. <laughs> that, that's, it was solid research. It didn't leak, but it, it deformed yeah, it did. completely. So. <laughs> I think I put mine in the dishwasher once. <laughs> yeah. so. Oh. <laughs> I, I did the dishwasher and ruined mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I think I fixed the problem with the, the muting and unmuting because I, Jerry was able to unmute herself yeah. now. So if anybody else wants to try again. Uh, speaking of dishwashers, Brian, um, you know, I periodically clean out like a hydration bladder or even a water bottle with a bleach solution. Uh, you know, do you recommend something like that? Um, I've only used um, like tablets, um, like different soap tablets and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I think it. I think it was a. I forget if it was a bleach or a chlorine tablet. Okay. Um, but I don't. I also don't. And we should have said this. I don't use my bottle or uh, bladder for anything but water. Um, and then if you if you do that, then you mostly just have to dry it out and put it away. 
Um, I'm, I'm a little less concerned as, as long as there's not sitting water or anything like that for a while. It's when you, you do mixes or anything like that. And those, those smells will stick with it. Even when you wash it out, you have to be careful going to uh, certain parts of the country or anything. Because those odors will stick with it if you do drink mixes or, or anything like that. Um, and then you'll have to wash it more often and, and do those soaks. Yeah. But they, they usually the uh, cleaning kits for the bladders will come with um, something that holds it open and helps it dry out. So I, will just had a, with the, I will say with the experience with the bladders, we've had a few people on uh, our backpack trips that their bladders actually leaked or one of them actually developed a hole somehow. But, uh, and the other thing is it does take room take up room in your backpack once it's filled. So just keep that in mind. Yep. Yeah, I actually had three times myself when I had a bladder leak down inside my backpack. So once when the hose popped off, once when the spout popped off, and once when it wasn't sealed properly when I twisted it shut. The old camelback ones used to be a little tricky. Um, so I still use them periodically, but I, I am really, really careful with them now. I learned from that how you really have to treat them gently or you can end up with. And the other thing I do is that I, I line my pack with a 55 gallon garbage bag, plastic garbage bag, and I make sure all my other stuff is inside that bag and my hydration bladder is outside that bag so that if I have another leak, it's not going to soak my sleeping bag and everything else in there. Some things you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah. So Carolina was asking uh, what would be the best source for uh, topo maps and uh, most recent reports of water sources. I know Nancy, you threw out there, National Geographic obviously has a, a good selection or the USGS. I don't know, Brian, other thoughts on that one? Uh, for maps, you, you, you nailed them both. Um, there's there's a few other uh, less known mapping companies, depending on where you're going, uh, but Nat National Geographic will have the, the most selection. Uh, but as far as recent reports, that's that's where I call the ranger station. Um, you know, it's it's tough. Uh, otherwise, you can you could read blogs, but uh, if the blog's even a month or two old, you know, you you're in a different season. Um, or it could be in a different season and, and it, the blog might not be as reliable, but um, you know, if, if you could call somebody that's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have yeah. Another, good, another good example on that. So I, I've started a collection of, um, I'm on, I have an all trails app and I've started collecting examples of when people put ratings out there and say, this water source was completely dried up. I got there and I couldn't, I couldn't have any water. This other thing happened. And it, what it is is that people have looked at a map or they've read what took place in September um, and they didn't call and get real-time information. In some cases, people even were saying, I was just here three months ago and now th this is what I'm finding. So the trails are, if you're out in nature, things are growing, the weather's changing, the, you know, it's getting warmer, drier, cooler, rainy, whatever. You might have high water that you can't, there's all kinds of things that could be changed even from one week to the next. So even a place that I'm pretty familiar with, I never go. I never go there without calling the ranger station to ask about right. current conditions. Yeah, unfortunately, I've found that a lot of rangers don't seem to get out of the ranger station quite as much as <laughs> as they would like to. I'm sure. That's true. <laughs> um, That's true. So uh, sometimes you do have to rely on uh, either the maps or guidebooks. Uh, you know, most major areas do have a guidebook. So if you're talking the gorge or you're talking Big South Fork or certainly the Appalachian Trail, those kinds of areas, there there are guidebooks. To Nancy's point, you you can't. 100% rely on them saying there's a stream there, but often they're good about saying that it's seasonal or intermittent or unreliable. So that's, you know, you do the best you can. And I will say, Barry, seasonal means seasonal. <laughs> yeah, no, <there's laughs> well, no You know, I ran into that last year in, on the AT and it just happened to be one of the hottest weekends they ever had from, uh, from Springer Mountain North and, uh, when you got to seasonal, there wasn't anything. And another good source is if, you know, you're heading north and you see hikers coming south, yeah. they're yeah. more than well, willing to share that information with you and just ask them, hey, they say there's a water source at this spot. Did you notice or have you checked it out? And, and that's a good way to get, you know, real time uh, information. Um, I think, uh, Jim, did you have a question? 
Yes, I did. The shelter we trace, right? Somebody's been there, right? Yeah. Okay. What do I have to do to filter down there? Is the Sawyer squeeze good enough for pretty much the whole thing? Uh, I haven't been on the whole thing, but all the parts that I have been on, that's been sufficient. Yeah, I would say, I, I, again, I haven't been on the whole thing either, but I can't imagine any place along there that a filter isn't sufficient. The only thing that I would say about the Sawyer is, um, and I don't know how, maybe you've already experienced this, but if you have to get water from a shallow source, like really shallow, just because you've got this plastic bag that wants to collapse on itself, trying to fill it up in a really shallow source can be pretty difficult. So when I use the Sawyer, which I've, I'm with Denise, I've switched over to the Bee Free, I like it a little bit better. Um, but when I carry the Sawyer, I also carry some kind of a little itty bitty plastic dipper. Like I've seen people cut off the bottom of a Coke bottle, which you can then just smash up and put it in with your filter and open it back up. So you can use it as a dipper if you have to get water out of a shallow source. Mm -hmm. Um, it, otherwise, it can be pretty tricky to fill your sawyer up and not get enough water in there to filter it. Mm -hmm. Since we're talking sawyers, I don't, I don't know how the rest of you guys feel. I, you know, I used the mini. Actually, I used it for a lot of years, but I, I finally switched back over to the uh, the next size up. I forget what they call that one, just because the mini would the flow would slow down just so fast. Yeah. Um, you know, even even in a short trip, it just seemed to you know, there's dramatic uh, degradation in the flow. So, so Barry, I, I, I do prefer the other one. Barry, you're saying you get 350 liters out of it? No, I did not get 350,000 <laughs> liters out of that sucker by any means. I'm not sure I got 10 liters out of it before it was painful to squeeze. So I have to say, uh, I, I, I also would like to uh, go ahead, Nancy. Go, no, ahead. go ahead, Jerry. No, that I also find to back flush the mini, uh, the Sawyer mini very difficult. It's not easy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, to back flush it is difficult. I, the other one's a little heavier. I forget what they call it, but it's slightly larger, slightly just bigger. Just the squeeze. Yeah, yeah, just the Sawyer squeeze yeah. instead of the yeah. mini. Yep. Uh, it's the a other little thing heavier. I'm, but the other it, thing I, sorry. Go ahead. The other thing I would say about the Sawyer is that um, – I also learned to always carry a second Sawyer bag when I was using that because I, I, I've seen it happen to other people and it happened to me where, where the, the spout fits into the plastic bag itself right around that rigid edge. If you squeeze the bag wrong, it, that can pop right through the plastic and then you've got a totally useless bag. So the filter's still fine. If you have a spare bag, you can twist it into and the bags are pretty light. So, um, Yep. I always carried those two things, a little dipper cup and a second, a second spare bag when I was using yeah. the sawyer. And, and actually, uh, Nancy asked a question here about filters and purification items working with any water bottle. Mm -hmm. And in the early days of sawyer in particular, and I, I think they improved this a lot. To your point, Nancy, those bags would often uh, leak or explode. Um, I, I do think they're a lot sturdier now. I was actually using a platypus, um, you know, mm -hmm a collapsible bottle, but the threading on it was slightly different than the Sawyer threading. So I think in answer to your question, Nancy, is that I don't know that the all bottles are threaded exactly the same. I know Smart Water and Sawyer match up perfectly. My platypus was a little bit off, but it was workable. And then for the other kinds of filters, Brian, I, I'm guessing they're all pretty much Nalgene kind of standard. Yeah, they're built more for now, jeans. I mean, there's, again, it just has to be the same diameter and, and similar enough threading. So it's not that it won't work on some other brand's hard bottle, but um, you'll, you'll want to bring it in and test it out or, or, or yeah. whatnot. Yeah. So I just the said, bee free, the bee free has different, uh, doesn't fit any bottle that I found. So I had mm -hmm. to buy a special bag that comes with it. I'm reading Nancy's question and I'm wondering, um, so just to expand on that a little bit, so the water bottle that you guys are talking about is the dirty bottle, the water that you get, the bottle that you get your dirty water in and then you squeeze or put it through the filter. Okay. So, all right. Depends on, the filter, sure. depends on the filter system. So yeah. like a, a Sawyer squeeze, yes, it's yes. the dirty water bottle. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, like the uh, MSR pump systems, right? The, you put a, like an algae on it, yeah. and it's yeah. actually, that's yeah. your clean water bottle. Yeah. So yeah. I think it just depends on the system. Yeah. But also on something like the Sawyer, I mean, I might have my Nalgene. My Sawyer isn't going to fit the Nalgene, but I just squeeze it in from the oh, top yeah. into yeah, the yeah. Nalgene. Yeah, so it exactly. Doesn't, it doesn't have to fit the bottle that you're going to drink out of. It just needs to fit the water that, or the bottle that you're carrying, you're right. collecting your dirty water in. Right. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. That's what I meant. So I think all of us kind of carry usually one or two water bottles for clean water. And then let's say we're hiking and you have a dirty, we call it dirty bag, where you put the dirty water in and that will fit easily in one of your side pockets for something. It's going to be a while before you get a water source again. You, you know, you're not carrying three or four water bottles. You have these flexible bags that once they're empty, you can, you can uh, roll them up and they're light and they just stick in your pack. So that's another thing to consider is, uh, you know, you, you can use your dirty water bags is to carry the water, the dirty water. So Brian, there's another question here. I think this is for you from Nancy. She's asking, do you need to flush clean water bottles for residual dirty water in the thread? So, so um, if you're using, if you're, if you're collecting water in a, if, if you're collecting clean water, you mean, so that it's not a dirty bottle. Um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking it means like, you know, like Barry was saying, some of them, maybe it screws onto your Nalgene and you're pumping yep. Through the filter into the into the water bottle. So the threads are, are safe at that point. Anything that's coming out the bottom of that filter uh, or whatever is connecting to the bottle there um, is is should only be clean water at that point. I, I've actually heard what Nancy's talking about in the context of um, either using tablets um, or SteriPen, oh, where yeah. okay. you're putting clean water in a in a bottle, then you're treating it. What they tell you to do is then you, you close it up, you turn it upside down, you loosen the threads enough so the clean water kind of dribbles out through the threads so that you've now got clean water everywhere. So the only time I've ever heard that is where you're actually treating the water in your bottle. So tablets, uh, drops, scary pen, that kind of stuff where you might have dirty water in the threads. and. Even that, I don't know if that's overkill, but that's what they tell you to do. That is your yeah, question, yes, that's, that's right. I, I was thinking of when you have tablets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yeah. That's we used yeah. to do that when we go up to Boundary Waters. You know, you you dip the bottle mm -hmm. into the lake, right, and yeah. then you throw some tablets or some drops in it, and then we would always do the flip it over and yeah. and clean the threads again. I I don't know if that's really necessary. I guess. It, logically kind of makes sense so okay thanks cool well it looks like that's all the questions yeah and it's 8 31 so we're gonna look at that. Time. good job that? yeah well thank Brian you does everyone. a good job keeping us on time yeah <laughs> thanks everybody yeah, yeah it's really good thank really, you uh, very good, good conversation guys thank all you right. thank you Jerry. all right thank, thank you, you. Week. Thank bye you. bye bye, bye.